Um, I just want to do a, um, a collective big round of applause for, for Klimis. Who's Um, so there's rumors going around I'm going to be two and a half hours. I'm going to probably take three or four. Um, but it is true. I've got more slides than I should have, um, but I'm going to talk quickly. And I've found a way of cutting into all of the slides to miss out a load if I'm running too late. Uh, give me one second. Um, I'm not phoning home. Hang on. I'm just setting my... Stopwatch. I'm going to ignore it. Um, so, um, thank you for being patient. Thank you for waiting until the end of today. Um, uh, this is me. Um, and I'm putting this here just to caveat that I'm not a fact-based researcher. Um, I may work in academia, but I'm essentially a, a kind of an opinionated practitioner more than anything. And I work on the basis of intuition, but I'm lucky in a way that I can pull in um, thoughts and inspirations and information from a lot of different sources. So, um, and the way I've been trying to work at the Royal College is just to try and embrace all of those different possible influences. Um, the lecture's called um, the end of structure, but actually this WB Yeats line, things fall apart, for me reflects much more about what this is, and it's about a crisis uh, that we're reaching, certainly in the UK. I don't know if any of you have been following the fantastic news that um, Boris Johnson may be our next Prime Minister. Um, I'm so thrilled, I'm probably not going home. Um, but this is, I think, a manifestation of what's happening, which is that as society becomes less complex and more organized, and as our opportunities to express ourselves um, either through anger or uh, experimentation or difference, as those get closed down, um, our choices become more and more binary, which means that there's an entro entropic process, entropy, where complexity gives in to disorder or a gridded structure. And that's exactly what's happening in the UK right now. Any difference in identity, in ways of thinking, are called out as if you are a traitor. That word gets used a lot in the UK now. If you disagree with what's going on, you get labeled as unpatriotic. Um, and this is difficult for a number of reasons. Um, sorry, I'm just going to go to my notes. Not that I've forgotten them. Um, so just reflecting back to Jerry's lecture, the keynote on the first day, and thinking about how our society forces us into narrower and narrower channels of uh, expression. Um, but at the same time is obsessed with difference. So what it's trying to do is govern um, by order, by grid, by prediction, by categorization, by classification. Um, and what that does is it takes out the risk of real difference, of real challenge, of real danger. Um, and this, this I wrote 10 years ago as part of the Anti-Design Festival. Uh, which was in 2010, just at the same time as I started working at the Royal College. And I, I came across it again going through all of these slides, and it seems even more true in some ways than, than it was then, that our apparent choice of uh, millions of colors, of endless opportunity, of um, individual expression is being boiled down to a series of pre-selected choices. So if you think about something like Instagram, where it feels like a space which is 
um, full of freedom, but in fact it feels increasingly like a prison yard where your options are predefined and there may be disorder inside the yard, but it's heavily policed, it's heavily governed, and the choices aren't there really to cause any damage or harm. And in fact, um, it's used more and more by um, the, the powers of oppression rather than expression. And what I love about uh, Patras um, going through yesterday and seeing government buildings with paint thrown at them, I mean, that was so joyful for me. Um, we don't, if you did that in England, you'd probably be imprisoned for 10 years. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, so that was just refreshing. I love that you can just like, you know, fuck Twitter, let's throw paint. And real danger is replaced by this sense of fear. Um, it's not actual fear. It's an implanted fear. It's like what's been happening over the past few days with Iran, building up an enemy so that these strong men can feel justified by picking out some opponent in order to justify their um, authoritarian, populist, nationalist policies. So this lecture really, and this thought, is a kind of a, a random, slightly structured journey through a lot of the work I've done and my studio's done over the last few years, but trying to understand it from the perspective of what responses might look like in some form. So it's been interesting for me to kind of review all of the work and then understand it from a different lens, which is largely to do with structure and how important structure is within the work we do as communicators and the degree to which we are flag bearers for possibility and change. See, society starts with um, a tribe, a small group, a family, um, who have certain beliefs, and then that grows into a village, that grows into a town, into a city, into a nation, and then it grows into a civilization. But at that point, the differences become more and more ironed out, and you have an entropic process of social organization. Um, that rapidly leads to decadence and decay, which then leads to, very often, fascism at that point of collapse. We've seen it cycled so many times in the past few hundred years. Um, and then everything collapses inward again, and then you have Dadaism, or you have futurism that leads to the Bauhaus, or you have punk after the challenges of the 70s. Um, and I'm not saying that um, I'm embracing war or collapse, but the fact is we feel closer to that now than I think we have done ever since um, the 50s or 60s. Um, and it's, uh, I find it terrifying. But anyway, um, on a light note, so a lot of my work has been about identity and our challenges in the field of maintaining our own individuality and differences. And what that's meant is that I've always erred on the side of ambiguity. See, I'd rather not dictate what a viewer or customer or consumer um, or client has to think, but I'd rather engage in a, an open dialogue where possible, where the possibility is not completed. It's like a kind of visual poetry where the the, the work itself is an engagement, it's a human-centric process of engagement. I'm not creating closed, pre-molded spaces. Um, and we're looking at the edge, quite often, of legibility as actually a process of dynamic conversation. I'd rather not have something that's completely... See, advertising and politics generally need you to, to think and re react the way that they're intending, which is a kind of entanglement. Um, they want to be able to replicate their thoughts in your, your mind and your responses. So the way to deal with that actually is to push out from convention and to break that down wherever possible. So in a digital space, 
um, to make things fluid instead of gridded, um, get rid of structure, to embrace the accident, things that weren't supposed to work this way, um, where the software has glitched and actually given a different kind of form of expression um, that then leads to a language of things at the edge of collapse. Um, and those are possible spaces, and I think we're responsible for creating possible spaces. You wouldn't want that in a hospital or an airport um, or a train station. Um, there you need design to perform in a, a systematic way. But on the fringes, we can, we can support possibility. And I think that's our duty. And it's not art. Um, it's actually trying to create new signals in the disorder that's happening. It's trying to find new possibilities, new empowerments, um, new thoughts as everything collapses. So this is the cover for the V&A Museum. Um, it was a, a fascinating trip. Thank you guys for yesterday visiting the Museum of Archaeology. Um, I think the revelation there was that 3,000 years ago people were doing amazing stuff. Um, I actually said to Klimas, um, if they had digital technology, what would they do? And he said, well, 3D printing, of course. Um, but just imagine with those minds what they would be, be doing with our stuff. Um, so I think things have to collapse before we can rebuild. I think to be utopic, um, you have to embrace this, this cycle. Um, here, the message is protect me from my protectors. Um, our apparent space where we feel constantly under threat gives license to our uh, line managers in government to send warplanes on our behalf um, and increase security at airports. Um, and then sometimes you don't need to do much. This was for a Plus 81, which is a Japanese magazine, and just realizing that by turning their logo sideways, um, it created a new possibility, which was, which was a face. So sometimes you have to look to not add things, but just changing what is already there. Uh, this was done, I'll check the date, this, is, this was done in 1994. Um, this is 25 years ago, and it reminded me how digital technology at that time, um, this was developed for a website at that point, but digital technology and internet at that point was so filled with possibilities, but it's since become highly utilitarian. Um, you wouldn't imagine to be doing something like this now as a way of sharing thoughts and ideas, um, as was this for a festival of experimental and concrete music at the ICA in London. And we need more of these things. We need more kind of radical things that don't necessarily make money um, or they don't necessarily win thousands of likes um, or they don't necessarily um, change normality. Um, but we are responsible and we need to get these spaces together. I mean, this, in a way, ICTVC is one of those opportunities and I think Amazing, seven. Um, you say eight is the last one. I have absolutely no belief or faith in that whatsoever. Um, I think the last five were all the last ICTVCs, <laughs> the final ones. So um, I welcome the next final ICTVC <laughs> um, and look forward to it and the continual ICTVCs after that. And then this was done actually um, earlier than that. This was probably 30 years old. And um, early experimentation with um, typesetting, with playing with different forms. This is looking at ways of thinking about concrete poetry. And then this was the first image I ever sent as a poster. And it went to Japan and it had to go on a modem all night. Um, and reduced down to, I think, A5, and then each color plate was, was sent separately, um, and it took all night, and then it was printed the next morning, um, and it cost um, actually thousands of euros in modem 
direct line transfer. Um, but it was so exciting to have it then printed that morning. Um, but I don't know how far we've pushed things visually in digital technology since these points. Um, the second thing we can do, apart from pursue disorder, thank you. Um, apart from pursue disorder and embracing disorder and then looking at opportunities to rebuild, we can, we can protect what we think is our right to experiment and explore difference um, that may be unpopular and also to, to protest. You know, I think that that is still a highly valid form uh, for thought. So um, all design is political. There's, there's no design communication which is not political. It affects our lives. Uh, this is about surveillance and the data shadows we cast. Um, these posters were done for an exhibition I had in, in Japan around that time. Um, and just looking at um, the desire to make things simple, and why should we be making everything simple? I think that making things challenging or difficult um, is exactly what we should be doing. I think historically culture was never just given on a plate, complex culture. Um, and I think we need to be again embracing uh, difficulty in making things hard, but also making things engaging. Um, these pieces were particularly about the futures we're creating for our, our children and the next generation. On the left is very much about the um, addiction to social media, to screens, to this granularity, um, um, drugs, dependency. And then on the right is, is what kind of world are we creating in terms of uh, technology and climate and opportunity. It's an overheated space. Uh, Free Me From Freedom was an event, um, uh, an installation at um, the Design Museum in London. And what is meant by this is free me from freedom, but give me liberation. So freedom, I think, has been co-opted by our governments. Um, and in London, you are more surveyed and observed than in any other city in the world, um, hundreds of times a day on a typical day. Uh, so this piece was about trying to uh, reflect and emphasize that, and we built this installation with cameras in all of these, these prints, um, which then got published out constantly um, onto the internet so people could go home and see themselves. Uh, having been uh, surveyed 400 times to kind of bring that message home. Supreme, um, the New York street fashion company, were very happy to embrace um, ideas about protest as using their, their clothes as posters, as vehicles. Um, and then anxiety, uh, thinking about pa Parkinson's, is the loss of identity, but due to medical conditions. And I'd taken the letter I out of the main words here. So um, we read anxiety in Parkinson's, but I am missing. I was a bit surprised I found this, and I think I showed this last time in... Actually, some of you have seen all this before, and I'm so sorry. Um, I've tried to put a few new things in. I'll buy you a drink later. Um, but in, in the 80s, I did this for the um, African National Congress, um, the South African protest and guerrilla movement, and also Red Wedge, which was about ensuring that um, both anti-racist and socialist ideas were brought into society through music and other cultures. Uh, this was a protest piece about the London Olympics, and it was about the idea that our governments are running rings, running circles around us. Um, and then going the, other, sorry, going the opposite direction completely, thinking about how simple the power of the individual is in changing the world. And if you can get enough individuals together, you can exert influence. And this was, um, I think, the most successful campaign in North America in terms of getting signatures to pressurize the American government into supporting uh, funding for third world nations. 
And then something that's going on a lot right now, which is the shift away from motorized transport um, and to support Jerry on his amazing trip from Athens by bicycle. Um, we're sharing the bicycle back on Sunday. I think. The third way of thinking about things is by creating fluid structures, um, sometimes for other people to use. So a lot of design creates fixed structures. It creates fixed grids. Um, but we've been working with, in some cases, uh, large organizations like the BBC who have millions of pages, hundreds of thousands of subsites. But what we did for them was build them a, a, a box of modules that they could add to. And from those modules, those building blocks, they could then create anything. Um, so they were able to build a multiple set of variations that were easy to manage and allowed them endless possibilities. So sometimes creating enabling tools is the, the role of the designer rather than imposing something that sits on top of what they do. This is about supporting the ambitions and the expressive possibilities of the client. You know, building sets of icons, building sets of... Um, possible ways of thinking about color combinations, of, of type scaling. And then we did the same with the times, um, but in a different way. What we did for them was we helped them understand that their role each day was to create new theater. Um, they weren't about fitting news to their predefined um, formulas. They were about making the formulas adapt to the news so that they could tell a story that might have a lot of drama and impact and at the same time they might say something which is more informational um, or lead you in, into other places so we'd help them reduce from a broadsheet a huge um, page size um, into this smaller um, semi-detached uh, bungalow and we created in that process, instead of large gray pages, um, at least 30 different ways of saying the same story, but through different lenses. So it was easily adapted by people who were used to reading news more on uh, internet sites than on newspapers. So borrowing some of that digital language and then feeding it back into print, which then fed back into their digital website. Um, it seems fairly normal now, but the use of pictograms or the use of numbers or the use of pull quotes or opinion pieces or small boxes or presenting the story in a number of different parts um, and then thinking about the drama and the way that you crop an image um, so that you can get the iconic heart of that story over, um, helping them become more cinematographic using the spread rather than the single page um, allowed them then to create kind of clusters of these different news props, like a theatre prop, um, under one banner. H Plus is Arena on Plus, and I'd stopped doing magazines for quite a long time, um, but then I was approached to do three issues and kind of wanted not to do it, but then understood again this was a way of looking at how we can make our structures more fluid. And with Arena, it was more a case of dissolving the grid and dissolving all of the things that we might normally think of that we have to follow um, that have been inherited from physical printing, from letterpress, from having to make galleys. Um, and we still carry that into our, our uh, design spaces even now. Um, we still imagine that there's an edge to the page in digital space, there's no edge. Um, and you can even wrap things off and over a physical page. So um, just thinking then about uh, inspiration, I'd grown up with uh, reggae in London and we saw it all through these seven inch singles and each label had to drag and draw attention to itself on uh, a record shop wall. Um, but it was all cheaply produced, one or two color maximum. Uh, this had a huge impact on my aesthetics 
and my understanding of design as I was growing up and trying to borrow some of that impact and then bring it into what it might mean in a magazine space. So looking at how I could bring some of that simple dynamic in um, and break up the page in different ways um, and then understand how to start working with a lot of copies. So we started designing fonts for this, typefaces, because we realized quite quickly that in order to liberate ourselves, if we could have control of the building blocks, that meant we could be free with everything else. Um, and if a, if a particular typeface wasn't working in a space, you just redesigned the typeface. Um, and then that allowed the space to be freed up again. So exploring how far we could push some of these ideas um, and create drama and think about relationship to images. Could they be embedded? Um, and then looking at the theme of the magazine, which was moving from that kind of social and political commentary um, through to something which was a little more propagandist. Um, Joanne Furness, who was the editor, her background had been in Manchester. Um, she grew up in a, a kind of working class, highly politicized family. Her father was a real activist. Um, and so bringing some of that uh, political edge to fashion and culture, we built this font, we called it Popaganda, as a way of engaging both spaces, and then started to break up the grid. So the grid on this page doesn't exist. Um, and column widths, we've taken from other places and then brought them in here and then flowed headlines in. So this actually says Raf Simmons 15 years, but you get a new kind of poetry by reading across. Um, so sometimes using the kind of ideas that William Burroughs would work with, you need to bring in a third element that disrupts what you do in order to deliver and discover new thoughts. You can't just sit and think about how that might lay out. You have to bring process in that turns it into an experimental space. And there's other things going on here deliberately that it's following a very painterly approach. So you have this curved figure on the right, um, which is echoed by the weight of the headline on the top left. You have this diagonal here so that the figure on the bottom left-hand corner is somehow echoed by the scaled face at the right. And then you have vertical type flowing through that, that brings a kind of punctuation. Um, so this diagonal fluidity and movement is something we tried to keep all the way through the magazine. So scaling things and positioning them in a way you shouldn't normally do so allows a different dynamic. Um, and the type is now being pushed out of the page uncomfortably. Um, it's coming back in here, but it's kind of falling off the top of the page. And it's not quite happy where it is. It's, it's jostling for space. And then you have the calmness and authority of the, the singer, the model on the right. And then breaking that down again, having text start to flow in, and we have now the aggression is moved to the right-hand side of the page. It's a more confrontational space. And so the text retreats. Uh, this is an amazing story by Nick Knight, the photographer, um, with Simon Foxton, the stylist, um, looking at bodyguards, but dressing them in tutus. So again, it's about defying expectation by bringing in a process that creates a new thought and a new possibility. And the same here, this is embracing disorder. Judy Blame, who unfortunately died last year, was a, an absolutely brilliant London stylist. And this was the only space in his house where we had enough distance to actually have a photograph taken. Um, and capturing some of that disorder in, t in turning things upside down, making things a little difficult for the reader. And abandoning all of those grids completely and using just typography now, trying to think about how white space can be used 
as an oppressive force, pushing this type down uncomfortably. The type is now struggling to be heard. Those words are trying to pop out. And here is the oppressive force creating this kind of breakaway thing on the right. Um, and again, reversing that. So the oppression now and the force and the weight and the energy is coming from the text itself, pushing down into these spaces. So this is all about disorder. But using disorder and actually riding it like a wave as a way of bringing new dynamic possibility and understanding different ways of saying things. Um, grid is abandoned. None of these columns are the same width. Now, the second issue we did, we, we focused much more on the formulaic, or rather the formalistic rather, side of the font. And we, we stripped out the middle of each character to create a stencil version of the previous propaganda typeface, um, and then try to look at it, what happens if you bring a more classical component in. So now looking at things that are centered, um, looking at the shapes themselves, um, trying to create artificially imposed classical structures, um, creating an, an, a deliberate imbalance. It's almost as if he's trying to kind of crouch so that he can fit in below the top of the page. And then celebrating and embracing shape um, and the beauty of, of sculptural shape. Looking at how we juxtapose. Juxtaposition is a really central idea within all the work we've been doing in the studio. It's how do you bring two things together to create a third possibility. Again, William Burroughs, The Third Mind, working with Brian Geisen, um, that if you cut two bits of text down the middle, join them together, you can create new thoughts that you could never have sat and, and dreamt of. Um, taking the S and repeating it creates a new form again that has its, its root in typography, in regular, readable, legible typography. Obscuring, allowing people to imagine this is not augmented, this is um, disguised. The third issue I'm going to just briefly mention. Um, we took a, a typeface that we'd created in the 80s for a boxing match in Tokyo. Um, this was developed in 1988. Jesus. Can we make the next ICTVC the last one? I think I'm too old for this shit. Um, if, if the catering's better. <laughs> I'm kidding, by the way. Um, so we took Tyson and then decided, as this is the building block, how could we take something which is so aggressive and sharp and geometric and then force it to be a little more empathetic um, and sympathetic and vulnerable? So we processed it by pushing the edges in um, until it reached a much more vulnerable state. These are the same letter forms. Um, and using them in a more kind of poetic way uh, sort of liberates the uh, possibility of sensitivity from within the forms. So sometimes it's not necessarily the construction, but the, the way we process and apply the font forms. And then looking at inner flow, and then how do we create something which is more engaged, that has a self-determined set of relationships between the individual elements. So there's not an imposed order or structure here. The order and structure is symbiotic, and it's come out of what happens when you put something down and you put something next to it. It starts to form a fit, and in the end you end up with something that is, is not formulaic um, and then could fall apart again at any moment. I'm going to briefly look through uh, Vandals. It's uh, an underground Parisian magazine, 
Um, we've done two issues with them, and um, I'm just going to show a few pages from the second issue. Um, it's the, most of the I can't show because it's um, actually highly pornographic, um, but I don't mean exploitative, but it, it embraces sex in a way that uh, is not taboo, and it wasn't um, using sex as a way of selling anything, um, but it was just an extremely honest, open embracing of uh, sexual tropes and uh, human activities. So we use that in a way um, of in, uh, bringing it in to a typographic space in which the type itself uh, acted as a displacement or, or as a window for things. So um, starting to look at, again, rhythm and repetition. Um, so structure breaks down and gets reimposed um, and looking at what happens when you bring in a different container to the image itself. Um, instead of having the image on the left, the image is put inside the body copy here on the right. Um, and here, the letters largely form simple windows that distort the background through displacement and distortion. So it's looking at that point at which the storyline gets embedded in the story itself. So you can't see where that edge is. And again here, um, legibility. Um, I'm sorry I missed the lecture earlier about um, difficult type. Um, and my honest feeling is that, that there's times when type should be clean and clear and crisp because you need to understand how to leave a building quickly. Um, but there are times when it can be difficult um, and it can embrace. And then looking at shape echoes, taking part of the chest, um, displacing it and then repeating it on the left. Um, to simply have the, the image itself reimpose itself on top of the headline here to allow a window back in. So there's a cycle of layers and then simply taking the letter forms out as a shape from the image on the right. Um, structural engineering. So this for me is about, I'm going to run a little bit over time, but it's not going to be two and a half hours, guys, OK? Um, if it is, shoot me. Structural engineering is, is another response, and it's not about embracing the grid and the structure, but thinking of design and typography in a far more mobile, enabling way. Um, the building blocks of any form of visual communication um, are normally the image or the choice of typeface. So, in a space where the imagery is interchangeable, the typeface then has to become the DNA that embraces and embodies all of the characteristics of that particular individual or institution or corporation or group or society. Um, a lot of companies we're working with now don't want logos. Brands don't tend to use their logos much anymore, except as uh, profile images on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. So the logo itself has diminished power. It's just simply an indicator. The font itself has enormous power, and it has the power to liberate, to form any kind of scale from information to expression. Um, just as a side thought, my thinking a lot over the last few years has been to look at design um, and our culture through different lenses. And one of them is, is through the lens of physics, physical laws, um, entropy being one of those thoughts, um, and laws of attraction and thermodynamics. But then on the other side is also looking at natural phenomena. And thinking about survival and our need for survival and then understanding brands through that. And brands need to either attract or attack. They need to either 
pull you in or they need to take over from everyone else. And in doing so, brands tend to embrace entropic processes. They'll replace a lot of local complexity with their own model. And so everywhere you go, you experience the same kind of Starbucks, for instance. This is an entropic process. It's a form of grid based on disorder. Um, but helping individual spaces control their languages is, is a vital thing that I think we can help people with. So the Mayo Clinic is North America's um, largest not-for-profit private healthcare service. They have a million, a minimum of a million patients a year. Um, they're the most um, prolific in terms of uh, research output. And they came to us wanting a typeface that they could use on everything. We ended up pointing out to them that they didn't just have one audience, which is a common mistake a lot of companies make and individuals and corporations make. Um, they actually had three audiences that they needed to speak to in three very different ways. One is patients. Patients need reassuring. They need something which is clear, that doesn't get in the way, that's understandable. Um, and then you have the professionals. They publish a lot of academic research papers. So the language here has to be different again. It has to be a specialist expert. Um, and the partners. The partners are the business partners and the people that might bring endowments or gifts or government. So the voice changes again. Um, this also implies that there's scale, that we need like the large stuff for signs on an ambulance or um, a sign to get to um, the ER department or a &E. um, And then on the other hand, you might need the scale of a heading on a published piece of research which needs to be quieter and highly informational. Um, so you've got scale and you've got difference. So what we helped them develop was a sans and a serif version of the same spine, the same geometric structure, which under under pinned the rest of the work. Um, here's the set of options that we created for them. So this all has a family link at the heart, but they all allow different forms of expression. This is the grid of alternatives, um, weights, widths, and styles. Um, again, just making sure everything aligned properly. So they now feel more empowered to be able to address all of those different audiences. Um, and it doesn't matter. It could be in any situation. So the design space um, becomes immaterial because they're now empowered to be able to control those design spaces with a valid voice. And then here's a, a, just a few examples of how that panned out. So here you would need something which is a little more contemporary, and then here we're into something which holds more traditional values um, and trustability, but in terms of knowledge. This is a how-to, uh, two versions of the same piece that they might have considered for different audiences with the same information. And these are the three locations, so looking at making sure it works on digital platform, obviously. I mean, this is all stuff you know, but um, it, was, it was amazing to be able to get to do this across all of their, their kind of communication landscape. And ironically, we got that job through these people um, that we were recommended by Coca-Cola to the people at Mayo, which is an interesting route. And Coca-Cola had never in 130 years odd had their own typeface. Um, they've had their script. Um, we did this, this poster for them looking at the, interestingly, the, the, the recognition value of their the brand, which was the bottle itself, which is as highly recognized as the font. Um, we came then with a typeface which we called Unity, which um, 
allowed them again to have the same language working across all of their different spaces um, and freed them up. And we spent three days in their archive um, getting lost and buried, and it was an amazing thing. It was in Atlanta. And we got to look at um, decades and decades of uh, space, I mean, bigger than this room, of all of their, all, from every single country they, they've operated in. Um, and it allowed us to, to luxuriate in looking at different typographic details um, that they used to bring in when everything was, was drawn by hand. Sign writers would do the signs on the stores, on the boxes, um, on the, the machines that went in the stores. And our job was to somehow combine something which was highly contemporary, extremely functional, flexible across all platforms, and bring in the characteristics that somehow would still make it Coca-Cola. Um, so deliberately embedding some of these details which had been pulled out of their archive references um, led us to this as our, our core spine. Um, deliberately wide, um, deliberately having some details which you only see when the, the font is enlarged. Um, deliberately not a huge amount of weights because they need to manage it across a lot of different um, territories. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a conflict because of, on one hand, I'm proud of the work we've done. My mum's thrilled that we've worked for Coca-Cola. Um, but it's Coca-Cola, so I'm not sure what I'm helping or not helping here. They estimated that since the beginning of time, when they started producing uh, bottles, um, if they had all those bottles here right now, every single person in the world would have over 1,000 bottles. So I'm not sure what that's doing to our ecology. But don't tell Coca-Cola I just said that, because... Um, yeah, okay, tell them. And we just worked for four years, nearly five years with Samsung. A similar kind of problem, again, trying to build something that um, brought all of their different pieces together. And in fact, this was our challenge of more than 20 major product areas. Now, all of the product areas and divisions in Samson historically did not work together. They were in competition with each other. So the division that made um, uh, TVs didn't work with the division that made vacuum cleaners. And they had nothing to do with the mobile division or the laptop division or the, f the automatic flushing toilet division or the insurance division. So there was all these divisions, and they were all operating as sort of fiefdoms independently. Um, and in the modern world, they had to deal with an, a huge amount of platforms, from obviously from digital to in-store to print, um, to mobile, to web, to um, on-product, on-packaging, on-screen, um, on LED. So there's a huge amount of platforms and then various different, different operating systems. And we had to think about how that would work over 400, a minimum of 400 key territories and countries. And then on top of that, it had to be fully scalable. So it had to work as a functional font and typeface. And at the same time, be scalable up to large size in a store on a billboard poster. Um, and it led us to really think about how a typeface can, can operate and needs to operate as a mechanism. It's not just, this looks good and I can read the words. It actually has to work so hard these days, um, much harder than um, the lecture set I used to use um, when I was at college and first started doing design work. And so our responses were, to create a limited amount of weights, but each weight was tested for each platform to make sure it was the appropriate weight. So some screens might use the 400, other screens might use the 500. And here is the type together, so it reduces down. And as it comes up larger, there's a degree of personality somewhere in there. But 
The bigger challenge then was this, how do we then extend across a lot of scripts? And we ended up working with partners to develop around 140 different scripts. Um, but to tie all of those together, because they would often be working in the same environment, um, we had to make sure that there was a set of shared codes and DNA components and um, essentially drawing systems. But we couldn't do that at the sacrifice of localized character. So none of these are compromised, but where it was possible to align with the Samson DNA, um, we embraced that. So we might have looked at junctions where things come together or we might have looked at the spurs at the end of lines and curves, um, or the terminal cuts as always being perpendicular to the curve. But then there was individual elements as well. So the level of curve and angle changes here specifically whilst sharing some of the other components. Um, with the Cyrillic, again, there was angled teeth that don't feature anywhere else um, within the Samson story. And then working with um, Irene, thank you. I said I'd do a call out. Um, looking at developing the Greek, again, making sure that that was in line with everything. So we think after four or five years, we've now achieved that seamless connection. Um, we did Lao, we've done uh, all the Indic, working with partners, we've done Ethiopic, we've um, we think we've covered pretty much everything. Um, and then this is how it looks so that no one actually notices. So all of the work that goes into the back end, and I'm sure a lot of you know this already, all the work that goes into the back end for something like this font is designed so that nobody notices that it's been done. Channel 4, on the other hand, um, this is where it starts to change wanted a typeface that allowed them to not use their logo anymore, but allowed them to um, be recognized by any word. Um, and they had a particular characteristic which they said was Britishness, and I hope, again, not Boris Johnson-ness, but um, the Britishness of the, type, the typefaces that we've used, Gill, um, Transport, Margaret Calvert, um, people like this, Johnson, and we came up with the same typeface, but with two personalities. These are brothers in a family that don't speak anymore. Um, you've got Chadwick. This is our basis. This is formed by being influenced by the British Gothic and British grotesques. Um, it could sit on a train station, and they use this for news, for sport, for weather, for information, for texts. And then there's the wayward sibling here. Um, and what we did was we calculated what the most common used letters are in, in English in the alphabet. And we only focused on a few, so that almost any word you would produce or write would have at least one wayward character. And then overlaying, um, the differences are very slight, but again, playing on that idea that small differences get amplified, um, we end up with something that feels very different. And then now, in the UK, if you see something like this, uh, you know that this is Channel 4. I was going to show a video, it's gone, forget it. Um, Punk London, we helped them tie all of the different events together um, in their 40th anniversary year by, by creating a typeface that then anyone could use. So anything anyone did in, in these events, um, they could use this typeface so that it was like a, a shared language, um, so that you knew what something was by the font that was being used. Um, this is another punk. You may 
realise by now I'm not a Man United fan. Actually, I'm a Tottenham fan. Um, that final was so disappointing. I was so depressed. I mean, first time we get to the final and, and we all act like it was our day off or something. It was, I, was, oh, I was depressed for weeks. I'm still depressed. Um, a lot of you have seen this before. Oh, sorry, um, we did the number thing on the front of that bloke's shirt. Um, something some of you will have seen before, but I'm just going to run through it quickly again. Um, Fuse was a, an experimental typographic platform that we developed at the beginning of the 90s, and it carried on pretty much for 10 years until uh, I think the last issue we did was around 98. Um, we did an extra couple when we did a book on it um, uh, four or five years ago. But Fuse for us was a way of saying even further, if we're going to look at our fluid structures um, uh, that we can develop through our engineering, what are the building blocks? So now, not thinking about regular lettering that supports a regular alphabet, thinking about what, what if the alphabet itself became reordered? What if it was so limiting in its structure? What if language being a contract um, was also a form of censorship and limitation? What if, what if there were things we couldn't say using our languages? What if new forms would help us understand new possibilities? Um, so we started to wonder whether even 26 characters was correct for a Latin alphabet. Um, and again, sadness, this is by Gerard Unger, um, passed away since the last ICTVC, and he came back on the first issue with this amazing thing where he just developed 10 shapes. And you could use those 10 shapes to do anything. You could form letter forms, or could, you could use them in a more poetic way. This is one I did in the very first issue uh, called State, and it was all about the, the, the state of uh, collapse, um, pushing things to a point of illegibility, but allowing shapes themselves again to bring new thoughts. And then this is something we did in the very last one, which is called land writing. And it's copying the form of handwriting, but allowing it to become um, machine written. Um, so this was an automated process that created this based on handwriting principles. Uh, Tibor Kalman, um, also not with us, unfortunately, did a typeface where all the uppercase letters were, were good words and all the lowercase letters were bad words. So as you typed anything, you would have this, this war between good and evil. For this, um, we use the space between letters. So this isn't about positive shapes. This is about negative shapes and looking at how the space between words or the silence between sounds um, or the emptiness between buildings can be something where actually possibility happens. And we're working with a Japanese client right now and they have a concept of ma, M-A. And ma basically means emptiness of space where dynamic and possibility sits. So that's something that we've always been interested in. Um, here, Tobias Freer Jones has used that in a way. He's recorded conversations on the street of New York, and then he's put complete phrases into different uh, letters on the keyboard, so as you type, you can reveal a full conversation. Uh, David Crow took our fonts as an indication of genetic bias and control, and as you type your own name, you form your own face out of these copy of gene splices. Paul Ellerman asked his students to move beyond drawn letters into acting out letters in a passport booth. And then looking at news and its power to affect us, um, especially given now with, with deep fake, with, with uh, um, fake news, um, with the lies that we're being asked to believe, um, taking 
news stories from the Guardian splicing them, putting different splices into the keyboard again. And as you type, you have this kind of William Burroughs output where new stories and new thoughts would appear. Uh, for issue 10, we decided to abandon um, textual form completely and explore what shape means in terms of our understanding of written form. So then starting to look at um, different shapes, symbols, um, patterns, expressions, and using the keyboard more as a kind of musical instrument. So what we're developing here is musical texts. Um, abstract form exists in, in sound or in painting, um, even in sculpture um, or space design, but looking at it within a, a typographic space, I think is still a space that we can explore more. We just touched it here. Tobias Freer Jones, uh, the more you typed, the, the more illegible it became. It kept adding more and more noise. noise. And this explicit FM's piece where it's gone beyond physical form completely and moved into textual form. So here you're typing, creating new thoughts with, with noise. Um, and Eric Houston, uh, sorry, Eric, Eric Van Blockland and Eustace Van Rossum created this thinking about the ownership of our identities through corporate work and chemical signatures. Um, Stefan Sagmeister looked at all type as viral as a controlling mechanism. Fonts made out of plastic spoons found in the Royal College canteen. Uh, this I love, it's an identikit font. So as you type, you create these new faces. And this where um, this is the writing, the best attempt at writing by the mother of one of my designers who I worked with uh, a few years ago in the studio. Um, and she was suffering from multiple sclerosis. So this was her best attempt at writing. She, she couldn't write. She lost the ability to move her arms properly, but she wanted to be able to express her state and condition, not through words, but through expressing how her inability to use those words. And this is a picture of her at 16, just before she contracted MS for the first time. For the last episode of Fuse, um, I, this is the combination of the, the last font I did, and it ended up being used as part of an exhibition in, in Beijing, and I had no idea it was going right next to this factory place. So again, um, disorder, new order, and new possibility. So I'm gonna briefly run through the last stuff. Disobedient disorder means, for me, take nothing for granted, take no instructions, develop everything from new, um, don't think about commercial output, think about taking risks, think about trying new things that may not be accepted or may fail. Um, and we did the Anti-Design Festival in 2010, and I think we need to do another one again, because um, uh, it's based on the idea that success isn't about money or sales or um, likes or shares, um, but it's also about risking depth that might not be shareable or risky or might collapse or might only happen once and wasn't recorded or documented or shared or retweeted. So we did the Anti-Design Festival and it ran over 10 days a week, actually, over 20 venues. Um, we had 20,000 people come, which was amazing. It started off with that piece that I showed at the beginning. Um, so we started off with a manifesto which I think is what everything should start off with. Um, it happened here in East London, um, and we embraced failure and disappointment. Um, we 
said we were here to mismanage people's expectations. And it was an open space. People were asked to get involved and bring stuff. Um, we tried to copyright the word no um, to talk about how copyright and intellectual property was damaging so much, but we couldn't copyright the word no, but we could copyright the word no copyright. So we could have actually had infinite amounts of copyright symbols going off to the right. So this is the program uh, typified the approach, which is ad hoc, um, remade, repaired, fixed, remodeled, um, uh, mixing popular with risque, with filing as an aesthetic. Uh, we had a salon of installations. Um, we had a lot of live events. Um, we had exhibitions of artists that had been long forgotten that we resurrected. Um, and I was talking about this the other day. This is Bazooka. This is the uh, uh, French. Look these guys up. They're pretty amazing. This is the French Bondesina group that were around in the late 70s. Um, and punk happened in Paris in um, comic strip, in underground magazines, not so much in music. Bare Bones, the illustration collective, um, quilted money. We did a free font, which was just guns that we gave away. Um, London's smallest cinema, just had five seats. And it happened here. And it looked like this. This was our showroom. And the showroom was filled with discarded equipment from skips within a five mile radius of the event. Um, so we weren't about polished final stuff. We were about what might happen. Um, and we encouraged people to bring new things every day of the festival to add to the showroom or take things if they needed it. This is Morag Meyer Scoff's um, Neon. Can, can you read that? Yeah. Um, we're not. This isn't being streamed, is it, Klingers? Anyway, put a bunch of cunts next to bollocks. Um, and then, you know, renovating old technologies. We were doing a lot of work with these. This is Jonathan Barnbrook's piece on the right using teletext. And this was the gallery space. We had an open submission policy so that anything anyone sent us would go in. We had workshops where new things might happen. We had things where people would bring different bits of objects that they would, would be brought together to find a new possibility. We made painting on film. We made new films and animations. This is Yuri Suzuki's piece where he took a thumb scanner and attached it to a sound generator so that these things here would make music as you scanned them. We had this set of highly practical chairs. Um, because once you go off piste and look at what's not possible and then forget health and safety and everything else, you, you bring new thoughts. Um, OCD, we did a lot of work with transmedia, which is creating theater in using different platforms. Um, An obsessive classification disorder was the title of that workshop and that series, which ran the whole events. And there was cosplay. Um, we had a number of cosplay events. Um, anti, anti, anti by Ein. This was along the side of the building. The bollocks illustrator did this. Um, he has a kind of form of visual Tourette. And he can't stop. So this is on canvas. We did a, a pixel wall, which is black cups stuck over white cups. And Ian Wright, the illustrator, did um, a portrait of Black Sabbath, as you would. Um, and then on the first day, we had a band play, and the, the uh, vibration was so loud that all of the black cups fell off, and then people started making their own pictures, um, of which nine out of ten were penises for some strange reason. And then we had Dominic Wilcox for 30 days 
did a new design. So one of the designs he did was he did a pop-up utopia, a pop-up world, and he put it wedged between a chair and a fold-down table on a train so that one day someone's going to sit down, they'll open it, and they'll have this pop-up world appear. Um, and this was day 15, um, and this is a smoothie maker. You just fill the football with fruit, play it for half an hour, and then pour out your smoothie. And the final piece I thought I'd be about 90 minutes, and I'm going to be on it, um, is the last thing that we can think about, which is post-structural. Maybe we need to bypass all of this entropic process, um, and maybe we need to embrace an anarchic process. Um, uh, the way we're thinking about this in the Royal College is, um, certainly in the School of Communication, is thinking about post-discipline. It's not trans-discipline or cross-discipline or, or uh, inter-discipline, I've just said that, no. Uh, but it's post-discipline. Um, we don't have uh, students talking about themselves as, as graphic designers or, or illustrators. And then post-nation, um, with the internet we can go beyond boundaries and post-grid, you know, forgetting our social organization. And coming back to the theme of the conference, I think we need to be moving from challenging design to designing challenges. Um, we need to make this a proactive thing um, because ultimately everything is designed. Everything is a design process. The opposite of that is to do with the human um, condition of survival, protection, um, jealousy, envy. Um, but if we can put all of that to one side, everything is fixable. There's enough money, there's enough food, there's enough fuel. Um, and you know, given a more anarchic approach to um, our governments and distribution, I think that we can fix everything. Everyone can be taught. Um, everyone can have access to everything. And the other thing that we focus on in the school, and, and um, I was interested in picking this up from Shalini's talk on the first day, is, is it's all focused on, on intent, intention. What is your intention? Who are you? Um, you're the subject that sits in the middle of a space, but you have a relationship to your context. What is the context? Is it, is it within the art school? Is it within society? Is, is it within your family? Is it working for a client? within the world of other clients. So you have a particular relationship with the context in which you work. And then as soon as you do something, you change that context. It's an entanglement again. But you need to be really clear about what your intention is. What is your intent? You need to be very, very clear about every single thing you do and why you're doing it. And once you understand that, you can then look at your resource. It might be the people you work with or the money you have or, or um, how much space do you have? Do you have enough knowledge? Um, out of that is built your strategy. Um, if you divide that by time, when do you need to deliver it? How much time do you have? Out of that comes your tactical approach. So we try and underpin all of the teaching through this intent first. And as a result, um, across the whole college, really, um, people have moved beyond their traditional forms to respond to, to briefs and projects. Um, it could be physical. These are graphic designers, but working with sound communication or performance. Um, thinking about putting felt on uh, letterpress, and then how does that impact now thinking about graphic design, all of this has been inspired or started with letterpress going back into digital, carrying an elephant around the local Hyde Park. Messaging, um, thinking about our digital spaces. And some of these, I, I, obviously I don't know what their purpose was, but these are responses it could be physical, um, it could be light, it could be just a thought, it could be a statement, it could be written. Uh, this is a student who created um, 
virtual reality using using cardboard and projection. Um, open workshops as, as a response to a brief or building mechanisms or looking at how different viscous forms work. So what I'm happy about is that this journey is ending up with passing on the baton to students and education. And I think education can't be understated in terms of how important and vital this is. We need to be embracing possibility, not imposing thought and knowledge because students can find that. We're not the owners of that. Our role is to guide and push and provoke and prompt. Um, ending up with this or an analysis of how um, cloud storage is working as this invisible layer of control. And finally, just an elective. I know Sid is here. Um, she'll hate me for saying that, but um, Design Without is a process we've designed as an elective that happens every week that is really structured to break down your preconcepts and create new possibilities. Um, we have students come into this space. Maybe we had one who came in as a screen printing graphic designer who graduated in, in sound design um, as a way of breaking down your own preconcepts. This is one of our students creating a, um, a, a thing that gives out different scent based on, on a keyboard response to an image. Um, a Chinese student who's embraced the selling of body parts. And Sidi, who's going to kill me for this picture. And finally, I'm going to leave you with this. Um, which is a student who turned many different people into Hitlers using a, a moustache on a stick. Um, I've run out, and uh, I'll see you all at dinner, so thank you. Um, I am positive, by the way. I, I do think it's all about joy and possibility and, and love and all of that. It's not about just being kind of angry and reacting. Um, so, yeah, take away the positive from this. Thank you.